At the frontier of the Arctic world, amongst the tundra and glaciers, humanity is making a stand. A stand against climate change. A stand for sustainability and equality. Where man and beast live in harmony with nature. Where the commitment to leave lasting legacies can change the course of our future. For just as the midnight sun emerges from polar darkness, hope is born from action. This is Greenland. This is Extreme E. Electric Odyssey has donned its winter warmers for this week's episode as Extreme E returns to Greenland. We'll chat with JBXE's Andreas Bakarud to get a glimpse of the man behind the visor, gain insight from local scientists into the country's endangered glacial ice, and learn how ice melt and climate change is affecting the local communities. But first, let's remind ourselves why we are here. Season 1's Arctic x -Prix. The Arctic x in Greenland, racing to bring the world's attention to the rapid melting of the ice sheet and how it will affect our planet globally. Rosberg x Racing arrived with two wins from two and were looking unstoppable. But during qualifying, the Arctic chill ruthlessly ended their hot streak. Oh, my Taylor's rolled! The semi-final races were filled with plenty of drama and passion. Before the all-important final saw the first five-car race. Five cars then on the run down to the first corner. Up through the middle, Sebastian Loeb for X44. Nine times World Rally champion Sebastian Loeb opened up a huge gap on lap one. And just as it began to look like the win was theirs, disaster struck. The lead has got a rear right puncture. With X44 dropping back, Andresi were in the lead and battling hard against Rosberg X Racing. Over the crest, they are still side by side. The air they got there, incredible. Oh, the oh, damage, no. damage for sound. the Rosberg car. With RXR left out in the cold, it was Andretti who took home the Arctic x Prix crown. Congratulations, guys, what a race. Situated between the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans, Greenland is almost entirely covered with ice. However, the relentless march of global warming has triggered a concerning transformation, recording major ice loss over the past few decades. We are here at the Greenlandic Ice Sheet. It's the biggest ice cube on the northern hemisphere. It's 2,700 kilometers north-south and 1,000 kilometers east-west. Um, that's big. What was it like having Extreme E here in season one? That was great. It was the first big international sport event in Greenland. So we were very proud that we could hold that here. And it was also good to have focus on the climate change. I think Greenland is the frontier of climate change. We experience a climate change every day. So when you come here and realize that, as I have, I really hope that not just for Greenland, but also for yourself, is going to change your behavior, your use of CO2 and so on, because else we are changing the world to a worse place than, than it was. It's something you never see anywhere else. I mean, we have glaciers and stuff in Norway, but not on this size. We are actually standing on the ice sheet, as you can see here, 25 years ago. It was much more ice, it was always like up to there where you see all the sand and rocks. So it melted a lot because the ice cap is almost like in here. It's very sad to see actually because it's melting even faster now than it did 
before and actually see it with your own eyes. I think that's the most dramatic way to see it. From this special corner of the planet, Hedda Hossas connected with Professor Richard Washington, head of Extreme's scientific committee. Hello, Richard. How are you? Hello, Hedda. I'm very much wishing I was there with you. That's an amazingly blue sky behind you. Yeah, it's amazing weather. We've been very lucky. So yesterday I was on the ice sheet and I heard the ice is melting faster and faster. Yeah, that's right. It is. Uh, you know, in between the short years that it takes for us to get back to Greenland, that rate has increased a lot. And the new data comes from a very, very comprehensive study of about a quarter of a million new observations from 200 and something glaciers across Greenland. We're very fortunate to have Professor Peter Warrens, one of the great experts on ice and ice melts on our science committee in Extreme E. And Peter's flagged the increasing rate of ice melts in Greenland. He was the first to point out the thinning of ice from work that he did from data from submarines a long time ago, back in the Cold War years. And the number that they've picked out now maps on to about 30 million tons an hour of meltwater. It's an incredible mm -hmm. number. It's pretty hard to imagine how much water that is. It equates to about 16 million of the Extreme E cars. And those weigh about two tons each, as you know, they're pretty heavy. Yeah. For those who haven't seen those cars firsthand, it's about 2,970 Eiffel Towers, 577 <laughs> Sydney Harbour Bridges, and 60 Khalifa Towers. So it's, you know, that's per hour. It's mind-boggling size of water loss. What does that mean for the rest of the world? A key response will be sea level rise. And there's a million years worth of ice locked up in Greenland. If all of that melted, then we'd be looking at seven meters of global sea level rise. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, that would take out a lot of cities around the world. So in the fjords, the icebergs are warming things up. Yeah, that sounds a, a bit contradictory, doesn't it? Because you normally put ice in drinks to cool them down. But there's been some new studies that, are, as I understand it, are arguing that there's a separation in the fjords between that fresh water floating on top of the salty warmer water below. And that warmer water below then moves into the fjord and can essentially melt the ice below the surface. So Heta, I reckon you should jump on a boat and go and have a look at this for yourself. Andreas joined Hedda on a journey around the Elulisat ice fjord to learn about ice and icebergs firsthand with local guide Mick Ale. 100,000 years ago, the icebergs were part of the ice cap. They run into the, the glacier and eventually it will carve, fall into the, the fjord. And all the icebergs we have out here broke off about a year ago. Mm. It takes one year from it breaks off till it reaches uh, this point where we are right now. This one wasn't here five days ago. This one, the big thing the here. Big one right here. What? Yeah. So it's moving very fast. Did you hear that? Great. This is the black ice. It's pure water that has been melted on the glacier or the ice cap. Shiny. It looks like a trophy. When summer comes, the temperature will go up and a lot of the ice cap will begin to melt and all the water from the ice cap will run into uh, cracks or be collected in water reservoirs on the ice cap. And when winter comes again, the temperature will drop and it will freeze. And this time it will freeze without all the air bubbles. Yeah. So we can try to, to break some of uh, the white piece right there yeah. and uh, pick it up. And then you can uh, compare it. Yeah, pick this one up. We actually got to learn about the black ice and also the normal ice which is the white one here with air in it, which is lighter than actually the, which this one is called the black ice, which is much heavier and actually dangerous, as Mikael told us about. The color in the ice takes its color from the ocean, so it's very hard to see, especially during the night, where the guys are using their fish boats, driving in, in a high speed, and they don't see the black ice. All of a yeah. sudden, they hit it, and it can be a devastating accident from it. Racing has taken us many places, but I never saw myself going to Greenland. It's breathtaking to be here. It's incredible scenery and it's, it doesn't do justice in a camera. It's so much nicer and cooler and colder than on the camera lens. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's incredible.
One of the drivers joining us on the Greenland legacy trip is Rallycross superstar Andreas Bakkerud. He's back at JBXE for season four after a promising debut last year. We caught up with a Norwegian to learn more about his motorsport journey. I would say I'm like MMA in motorsport. I do it all. Extreme E, Nitro Cross. I've done a lot of different stuff, including like Trofa Andros, X Games, Pikes Peak, the hill climb, rallying. I think definitely everything in motorsport requires different skills and uh, you have to practice more towards that specific genre of motorsport that you're doing. Backward trying for the long round, the outside move. It's hard to say and describe yourself as a driver, but I do think I'm a strong rallycross, extreme e driver, good reaction, good in the battles and quick. Motorsport is a lot of, uh, of mentality, you know, it's of course you have the talent in there, you have the drivability and experience, but mentally it's the most crucial part of being a race car driver. I started with karting, with my dad and my uncle racing rallycross uh, championship. I did all the classes in karting and it was natural for me to go towards rallycross and kind of like build stone by stone from there on, from the lower categories, national level to European championship, becoming European champion and then fighting in the World Rallycross Championship. My Extreme E journey started as a championship driver where I drove passenger rides with sponsors and partners of Extreme E. All of a sudden, Heike Kovalainen couldn't drive in Scotland and I got a phone to come in a little bit later. And I started off there with JBXC and I haven't looked back ever since. As a race car driver, normally you go to a race and you eat and you take the flight back home. But in Extreme E, this is a very different championship. It's not all the time about the results and the driving, it's all about the legacy program, it's about leaving a better footprint when we leave the place than when we arrive. You get to see the local places, you get to see what they are struggling with, what they have to fight with. But racing that car is pretty cool, it's a fast car, fully electric, it's made for different terrain, like we do jumps, we do sand, we do gravel and dirt. The car has to tackle so many different variations of surfaces and I think it does pretty well. We have been struggling but uh, I think you know we're working very hard together inside the JBXC team to get into a striking distance. I definitely hope that JBXC can finish off the electric era on a high so that when we move into hydrogen that we can start up with a good energy. But for me also it's about learning the championship coming in very late last year. There's many ways to roam. You can try this, you can try that. It doesn't really matter as long as you drive, as long as you practice and at the end of the day a quitter never wins and a winner never quit. By that it means hard work pays off and whatever you set your target are in life, if you really commit to it, you're gonna succeed. Climate change often focuses on global scale data and distant consequences. But how does it impact the daily lives of both humans and wildlife in Greenland? We're gonna go uh, dog sledging. I've never done dog sledging before, so it's pretty cool. Uh, it's nice to see the dogs out there. Uh, I think they're gonna be rapidly fast. Kind of like our Extreme E car. We in Greenland have been using the dogs for thousands of years. They are almost like family. They grow up, I follow them their, their whole lives. We are half of the dogs we used to have here in, in Greenland. One of the reasons is that we have better machines that to some extent outcompete the, the dogs. But the main reason is climate change. Our season of going out with dogs is getting shorter and shorter because the weather is changing all the time. The lakes, the fjords are not freezing. If they don't have this job, then they will not be here. I think we have 15,000 dogs left, so maybe it can collapse and, and, and the breed will not be there anymore and a big part of our culture will disappear. The drivers visited the Elulisat Ice Fjord Centre to learn about the importance of ice to the communities and ecosystems of the region. Specifically for this area, we used to have sea ice and could travel on the sea ice up north. So we could take uh, dog sleds and cars and snowmobiles and go to other places. That area has ended. 
It's very obvious that the sea ice has gone due to the rising temperature of the sea. The most important thing with this uh, ice Force center for me is to tickle children's curiosity, to make them want to educate themselves, get to know more about how things are linked and, and what they can do to make it not a, a better world, but a good place to live. Owned by the Greenlandic government, the Kangalusawak International Science Support Facilities, known as KISS, provide laboratories and equipment to scientists coming from all over the world to study the local area. They are researching, for instance, the melting of the ice cap. They are researching on some of the methane which are provided from the ice cap. In 2001 or two, we could drive all the way up on the marine and on the ice cap we could also drive there, but we can't do that anymore because of the changes of the environment. In the last couple of years, we have experienced a lot more wet, like rain, which affect the soil, which also affect the roofing of our houses. One of the students working out of KISS is caribou expert Laura. Laura has been following the species and observing their behavior changes in this landscape due to the effects of climate change. Yeah, you can see that white spot just there. Yeah. Just eating, not, not looking at us, actually. It's very nice. So now it's sometimes it's easier to see if it's a male or a female because they have a white spot on their ass because they have this winter coat. Caribou is very, very important for Greenland. Mostly what I will study is their diet and their movement on the landscape. On summer, climate change will mean warmer temperatures, which will mean uh, more food for them, which will be fine for the population will increase. But also it has a negative point, which will be like, there will be more mosquitoes and flies, and they will harass them so much, sometimes they cannot even feed. But in winter, which is the important thing, there will be more rain instead of snow, and this rain on the snow means ice, and this ice will encapsulate the, all the plants so they will not eat, so the mortality will be very high. We also want people to think about their own role in this system and uh, that human cannot consider itself as superior to nature. We have a lot of tourists coming in from all over the world. They are very concerned about the melting of the ice sheet and wants to see it. And a very common question is the, to us is that what are we going to do about it? But I think we live only 56 people up here and it's a very, very, very big country. So we just have to turn it around and say, what are you going to do about it? Each year, Extreme E and their official sustainability partner, EY, publish a report to measure their progress and achievements. And there's some exciting changes for women in the championship and beyond in season three's report. Electric Odyssey was at the launch in London to find out more. We're here at the EY offices where Extremely are launching their Season 3 Sustainability Report. It's the third season that we've worked with EY to develop the report and um, it's super exciting. It's transparent so there's no hiding from your carbon footprint. But I think what it allows us to do is to measure it and to make real business decisions based on what we found. The partnership with Extreme e is really important to EY. We believe that we are building a better working world. It's really the essence of what EY is. When Extreme e set out to invent itself, it wanted to be the most sustainable race series in the world. It's very important to know if we're making progress. The sustainability report is, of course, to benchmark ourselves against ourselves. That's the biggest reason. Some key highlights are we're powered by 100% renewable energy, that is through hydrogen fuel cells, HVO generators and the solar panels. We've reduced our carbon footprint by 8.2% when compared to season two. Uh, that is a whole team effort, right from operations to food and beverages on site. And, of course, the biggest highlight of this uh, report is the female driver's improvement. The average performance gap between the male and the female drivers has improved by 51% since season one to season three, which is comparing six seconds roughly in the traction challenge down to one and a half seconds. So to find that much time on a racetrack over three seasons is massive. And I think it's testament to all of the work that Extreme has been doing behind the scenes to give the females a platform to really develop and grow as athletes. We all knew we would see females improve, but I don't think that we expected it to happen so quickly. You know, when you consider in season one, there was five races, and so that's each race to get to 29% improvement. It's massive steps in pace. 
it just shows when you give female talent, you give them access to the same technology as the men have, you give them access to seat time, you give them the best coaching in the world, you know, you've got Carlos Sainz, you've got Sebastian Loeb, coaching these great athletes, they get better. There is no reason in motorsport that there should be a gap between male and female drivers. And uh, as we continue to make this more appealing and approachable for women to drive, young girls to drive and be a part of the sport, the challenge will be on for the boys. Although we're announcing season three, we've already started season four, and what we're seeing is the females are beating the men now. And that for me is equality, is men beating women, women beating men, that's racing, and they're all athletes. The new format that we have where a certain amount of men and a certain amount of females have to start um, different races throughout the year has spiced things up again this year for season four. We're going to see a lot more of a spread grid. We're not finding the teams able to make such simple strategies as to whether they put the man or, or the girl fast on the starting order. So I think it's going to create a lot more interesting action on track. We've seen it happen in the past where females have won races outright over guys um, and I think it's going to happen a lot more in the future. Saudi Arabia at the beginning of this year showed just where the females sit now and it's really exciting to see and I think it's pretty cool to have those conversations in the paddock, you know, to talk between the drivers and hear the male's thoughts on it as well and how they're helping the females develop and um, yeah, it's, it's a really close field. Now. I'm a father of two daughters first and foremost and of course trying to make sure that there's a fair and honest world for them both to navigate in if that's in sports or the business world, whatever it might be. So being involved in the sport is very exciting for me. My girls are thrilled and cannot wait to be at the race in Sardinia to see other girls driving. It's really important that we demonstrate that the impact of the race and the way it's being run is genuinely leading to outcomes, not just for the environment, but for the races themselves. The female audience has massively grown in the last few years as well. From 29% up to 34% of viewers are now females, which is massive again for motorsport. I'm really happy to hear that females are interested in our championship. I think, of course, it's the perfect platform where half of the races are females. And I think that those numbers are being reflected in the female interest in general population as well. I think we've got a really unique format here and one that we hope that other forms of motorsport take on. The sustainability report also highlighted that in season three, Extreme drivers inspired and interacted with over 900 students on the impacts of climate change. This includes schools in Greenland, which drivers have visited annually since the season one Arctic X Prix. Extreme partnered with UNICEF in season one to teach students at this school in Kangalooswak about climate issues that affect their home. It's great visiting the school once again to understand what did they find interesting about the programme, what did they learn about the programme and how do they feel that's impacted them in their local lives and what does the future look like. One of the things was to get the pupils to become more aware about the climate changes in the area. So we developed the, the educational system with UNICEF and, and it was amazing, you know, the kids really enjoyed it, learning about it and, you know, actually trying to take some action. One of the big changes is of course that it's getting warmer so there's a new fish coming and a lot more fish coming. On the negative side it's raining more and the snow is disappearing, you know, the ice cap is getting smaller. The kids got to talk to the drivers and they got their uh, some photos and signatures and, and stickers. It's great for them because they're really interested in motorsport. What did you learn in Greenland? That there is 57,000 people living here and that is really, really beautiful. What can you guys tell me about climate change? Do you see it yourself while yeah, living uh, here? We, we bought a brand new snowmobile. We were excited to drive it, but there just wasn't enough snow last year. Because there is less snow here in the winters, right? After Hedda tried out Magnus's DIY Extreme E car in season two, it was Andreas's turn to give it a spin. I think actually one of the biggest things was that they got to meet other people. Here they met you guys that showed interest in the area and you were interested in knowing about them and they loved that they could show their neighborhood and still learn about the rest of the world also. 
Leaving a lasting legacy is hugely important to us, so it's brilliant to see the partnership with UNICEF is continuing to have a positive impact three, four years on since we last raced here.